And we are live! Hey everyone, welcome for another episode of the Puppet Podcast. I'm Caro BD, Caroline Bernier Dion. Yes, and I'm doing this podcast with a lot of passion. We are tonight at episode 78 with Philip Humbert. Ta -da -da, ta -da -da -da. Yay! I'm so honored to receive this gentleman to my show and it's such a pleasure to be all together all puppetry world how those fans of this art form talking about this art form and name what we are doing and what is this passion that we get with this so yeah before we go in the interview i want to let you know that we have this wonderful Patreon uh, community that we build. And the idea is to give tools to puppeteers about online promotion, about how, like this one, how we stream live, how also we have things about tips on, on having more contact, more opportunity in the, the business that we do in the art business. So yeah, we do those workshops and we invite you it's every weekend like the first weekend of every month so we really want a lot of people gathering around this so yeah i really invite you and i want you to say uh, i want to you to write from where you are watching right now and uh, if you have any question during the interview feel free to chat with us because we are live so that's what is beautiful about it so Ladies and gentlemen, I want to bring this legend of puppetry because he doing he does a lot of marionettes and a lot of stuff. He have been involved in movies, and so please welcome the wonderful Philip Humber. <laughs> Hello, <Hey! Caroline. laughs> Yeah, I, I really enjoy to do uh, uh, an entrance with a lot of ta ta. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you to be in the Puppet Podcast. I'm so honored to receive you. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. <laughs> yeah, so we have people watching from Australia right now. We have Rebecca who, who watched. Wow. So yeah, we will build this live thing and I'm happy you you jump into the live adventure with with us. So I want you to introduce yourself, like if people don't know you, because I think a lot of people s see your work or have discovered it. So maybe you can introduce yourself and, and what are you doing in puppetry? Well, uh, probably most people know of my work from the film work that I've done. Uh, I've done uh, two major films that most people know about. And one is Being John Malkovich which was done in 1999. And the other one is Oz the Great and Powerful. Now, a lot of people don't know I was involved in Oz the Great and Powerful because I was performing the character known as the China Girl. And she was a marionette in real time with the actors on the set. But later, most of her, her work was covered by CGI, but they duplicated the performance that I created for it but uh, I was pretty much in the background for that one. But those are the major things I've done on film, but I've done television, I've done uh, variety shows on cruise ships for 35 years, and I've worked in all the major uh, nightclubs in Europe, the Lido and the Casino de Monte Carlo in Monaco, and uh, <laughs> a lot of other ones, uh, uh, nightclubs in Switzerland, Zurich, Switzerland, called the Polygon. So, uh, I've and now I perform in one of the most famous variety theaters in Germany. It's called the Hansa Theater in Hamburg. And it's been performing shows there for 130 years straight. So it's uh, a wonderful place to work. And of course, variety, even though we have very little variety shows in the United States anymore, variety is still very popular in Germany. So that's where I get a lot of my work. Yes, and I want to ask you a question about that because variety is such an interesting, like melting pot of art. So how you find that puppetry have like really his place in into this art? 
Well, you know, in, in Europe, puppetry has always had a special place. It's, it's always been regarded as an art form. Mm -hmm. And when I work in France, uh, I, I'm considered an artist. And uh, just on at the level of any other artist, uh, and a lot of them are variety artists as well. So puppetry has this this better place than it had in the United States, I think, possibly because of the children's uh, theater aspect in the United States. Once puppetry was introduced to television, it was produced mostly for children's audiences. Mm -hmm. And because of that, then people decided, oh, well, this must be something for children. And then they lost the the uh, the knowledge of having puppetry as a true theatrical art form, which it is. Yes. And it can be a highly respected uh, art form. It's probably one of the most imaginative of all theatrical art forms because it has only no no limits, only your imagination. An actor as a puppeteer can become any character he wants. He can become an inanimate object that comes alive or he can become a little human character or an animal character, anything. So there's not too many places that you can do that in theater that uh, completely as you can with puppetry. Yes, a lot of freedom. And we have Brett here who say that you are an artist, Philip. <laughs> I think it's a great statement. Thanks, <laughs> That's I, good. So are, are you ready for the deep question of the Puppet Podcast? Oh, of course. Yes. <laughs> Throw it out there. Yes. I always ask those tricky questions. I want to know the why, like what makes the art of puppetry an art that you cherish? Uh, I think because it incorporates so many different parts of the arts. If you are building and designing your own puppets, and of course there's the artistry of that, of the design work and, and building work, and whether it's uh, marionettes, which I use, are, are highly technical. Yeah. So it, it takes a great deal of technical expertise to come up with a character that moves well and will be as expressive as you want it to be. But then there's also all of the performance aspect to the puppetry as well, so the, the actor puppeteer, is he, he's a mime artist at the same time, he has to be a dancer sometimes, and, and he has to understand movement and choreography, and, uh, and he has to be a good dramatic artist as far as sometimes speaking for the character and creating this uh, dramatic uh, voice that may be necessary to project the character as well. So all of those aspects are mixed in together, and that's what makes it so exciting and uh, the potential is unlimited. Yes, that's true. It's such a multi-talented artist that we, we need to, to become when yeah. we, we, we do puppetry. So yeah, I want also to know like the, the best path, like you name a lot of art form, but for you, in your opinion, what would be the best field of study to become a puppeteer? Well, I can speak from my own experience. I started with, I had my first puppet when I was only three years old, and it was because I was extremely shy. So I was exploring things through the puppet that I would, might not feel comfortable doing myself or saying to yeah. other people. So it was my way of expressing myself. But I started dance when I was six years old. I was interested in dance as well. So, and I loved performing, but the performing had to be on the terms that were comfortable for me, which yeah. meant that I had to be in the background. Mm. And perhaps that's kind of ideal for a puppeteer because every puppeteer must be a good actor, but not every actor is a good puppeteer because you have to be able to let go of your own ego in expressing everything through yourself and express all of your artistry through another body, so to speak, through another character. And so that's a whole different thing. And sometimes when actors get on stage, they won't let go of their own ego. So yeah. they overpower the puppet, especially if they're in plain view, which is, happens a lot with puppetry now on in theater. Uh, the puppeteer yeah. is frequently visible. So if the puppeteer doesn't know how to project everything through that other character, 
then he will take over very quickly and and upstage his puppet. Yeah. And of course, a really good puppeteer can upstage everything else on stage because it's like never work with children or animals, is the old proverb as an actor. And puppets can very well take over things because they they become so uh, dynamic because they're symbolic as well. Puppets yeah. can do things that human actors wouldn't dare to do and, and couldn't do physically sometimes. Yeah. So the puppet can pull in the attention so easily. Yes. And my experience has been working with animals a lot and a little dog specifically. That's my most famous one, Taffy. And when she appeared in theater productions, I had to be really careful with her, keep her very quiet and subtle because otherwise she would pull focus when she wasn't supposed to. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I have this in common. I have play a dog also. And I yeah. know that it's attracting attention. But it's so important for puppeteers to realize that this first and foremost is a theatrical art form. So when you want to uh, find a track to become a puppeteer, it's really good to do anything that a normal actor would do to enter the theater. And it might include many other things. You might study mime, you would study stage movement, you would, you would study singing, you would study voice in general, and, uh, and acting, and understand all of those parts because they all come into play when you're a puppeteer. You have to use everything. Yes, yes, that's so true. You have to use all your talent and put it on on stage. And I want to ask you, because you talk about this really briefly about the three years old crush maybe for puppetry. I want to know when and how your crush for puppetry happened. Yeah, it really happened about that time. My mother gave me this little hand dog hand puppet and that became something really important to me for expressing myself. And I would hide behind the sofa in the living room and the puppet would pop up behind the sofa and wait for somebody to walk through the room and then I'd have the dog start performing. And uh, right away I understood that puppetry was a way to express myself in a, a whole new concept. And it was felt very safe and comfortable. And also, like I said, the, the idea that you can do anything with, with the puppets. You can take on any type of character. And my mother had ran a doll hospital and she had everything was miniaturized, all these little doll furnitures and things like that. So right away I was fascinated with miniature things. So the puppets fit in with that perfectly because I could create this whole theatrical world using all these miniature objects that were already uh, at hand for me. And I watched the typical uh, puppets that were on television at the time. And that captivated me as well, because those characters were so dynamic for me. They were much more interesting than any of the live actors that I saw on television at that time. It was, it was all about Kukla Fran and Ali and Howdy Doody and, and all the characters that appeared on Captain Kangaroo. These are all the shows that were in the United States that I grew up with. So most of them were hand puppets, but uh, then there was Howdy Doody, which was a marionette. And I loved that because it was a full body figure. And that's what finally drew me, uh, even though I started with the hand puppets, it finally drew me into the marionettes because here was a full body figure that I could do dance with. Yeah. So I had studied dance and here was a way to create movement, dance type movements with a full figure and could be worked with one person with yeah. marionettes. That's true that the marionette is really good for dancing. Like the fact that it's the the string who give the motion, I feel it's really a, a dancing puppet. It's really something who could live this really well. So I want to ask you your definition, like what is in your own word, your definition of a puppet? I've always defined puppet as any inanimate object that's given the illusion of life by direct human means 
for a theatrical purpose. Now, I like all of those qualifiers to be in there. Number yeah. one, if you're going to create any puppet, I want to see an illusion of life in that figure. Whatever it is, I want it to suddenly become alive to me when I'm watching. And that adds that extra theatricality to it. But it has to be for a theatrical purpose. If children are just playing, that's okay. It's, but, but a true puppet is not a plaything. It is a tool that an actor uses to express himself. Yeah, it's such a great definition. I feel it makes me breathe. Like it's such a well explanation of like life making the the illusion of life. I love your word. That's amazing. That's well, you, you know, nowadays it's it's difficult sometimes because people who aren't familiar with puppetry and especially in the in the different media in yeah. in film and television if they aren't familiar with puppetry, they quite often just push it into a category where they say, oh, well, you're a prop handler or yes. you're doing special effects. But that's not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, puppeteers are actors. They're actors on an equal basis with any flesh and blood actor that appears on the screen. If the puppet isn't alive, it won't be interesting to the audience. It won't be compelling to watch. And sometimes producers and directors learn that the hard way because they're just too interested in, in the technical, in the mechanical. Okay, it does this, lifts its arm here, it turns its head this way. But if that doesn't have the life behind it, if it doesn't have the heart and the soul, then it's not compelling, it's not interesting. Yes. So it, it should never be pushed down into these other categories. Totally. First and foremost, actor. Yes, because you name it, it's a soul, it's breathing, it's art beating. It's, that's, that's puppetry. That's so true. Well, and, you know, yeah. When I did the, the character in Oz the Great and Powerful, China yeah. Girl, what was interesting about that, and, and people seem to realize on the set, they're all the technicians and the director. They realized that, you know, they might have thought at first that what I was doing was just going to be a little mechanical thing in front of the camera. Yeah. But the other actors that had to work with it, they became more expressive when they had this puppet in front of them that was, that was creating a personality and had emotion and, and was reacting to them in in the same way that other actors would. And mm -hmm. some of the technicians on set would say, oh, that that little puppet is a better actor than a lot of actors I know and things like that. Well, some of that was just uh, hyperbole. Yeah. But, but point is that when you have something like that, I, I was connected to that character. I was projecting a personality yeah. down through it. And there was a little girl who was the voice and she was projecting a personality through her voice and I was reacting to that. And we were molding together, we were melding together into this one character on set. And that's what gave that character its heart. And the director told me within just a very short time after I started working on that film, he said, I've fallen in love with China Girl. And you don't fall in love with just yeah. something that you bring yeah. on, you know. Yeah. I mean, it really has to have something more to it. So that's oh. that's what I talk about with the heart and soul. That's, that's that extra something. Yes, that's the little touch. And I feel <laughs> I, I get the same, same things happening sometimes because I was working also in circus industry. Do you feel sometimes we have to, like, not educate people, but tell to others what we are doing, explaining, like sometimes it could be defending, but do you feel sometimes you have to really like, uh, let's say preaching or, or give your message of puppetry to a set or something? Yes, I, I try to, I don't want to preach to people, but I try and express to them how important it is to respect puppetry as an art form. And there is always a certain learning process 
that yeah. happens at the beginning when I'm working on any project, whether it's a live theater production or a film production. I found the same thing that directors at the beginning don't quite know how to deal with the puppet. And, and then later they become so comfortable that they're talking to the puppet. They, they don't even look at me. They don't think about me. They're, they're talking right to the puppet and they say, uh, could you um, do this, that, and the other? <laughs> and, and there it is that they've, they've now accepted the art that I'm trying to create in front of the camera or on stage. Yes, that's so cool. And do you feel puppetry have reached its full potential? Like, do, do you feel we are in a golden age? We are in an ascension? That is really hard to determine. You know, puppetry has its ups and downs yeah. in every era. And it seems like we have these wonderful things that happened. Uh, when Jim Henson came on the, on the scene with the Muppets, suddenly puppetry exploded but it exploded specifically for that type of puppet. Yeah. And then the other types of puppets were kind of pushed off to the side, but still Jim understood the great power of, of the puppet and he used it better than anybody else had before then because he was using it through a medium that could reach millions of people at once. And uh, then, then we have different times where it kind of fades away again. And then Julie Tamor does these and Michael Curry do these incredible things on stage with with puppets with actors and sometimes the puppeteer is being fully visible as I said and then again it, it rises up and 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 Warhorse the beautiful work done in Warhorse too uh, you know so it there are these wonderful moments that come up and then sometimes we feel like we're starting over with puppets again. Even I'll go in to a, a project sometimes and, and the director will just not have any concept of what the potential is of a puppet. Yes, that's and true. So, so, you know, and I read an article one time that was written about 1901, I think. And it was Thomas Holden, who was one of the premier marionette performers of the time. And he complained that people just didn't respect puppetry as they did an average theater art form. And yet he appeared in front of the crowned heads of Europe. He toured all over and appeared in front of very famous and very important people politically and, and otherwise. And, uh, but in spite of all of that, by the end of the 19th century, he felt that puppetry wasn't respected very much. So here he had been at the height and then he was suddenly feeling it was always it was down in the in the dumps now again for yeah. puppetry, and and that's that seems to be what happens. It, it's hard to maintain. Yeah, that's that's true. That's that's why we have to make the art form maybe known or discover it and rediscover it, it personally also. That's yes, we we just have to keep working at it. I mean, I've done it my whole life, yeah. and I thought. You know, when I got certain credits, I thought, oh, then then people will know what I do immediately and I won't have to work so hard to try and get into the project. But no, it still happens. It doesn't matter what kind of credits I have. You know, the, the next project that I'm brought into, it's like I still have to build this up so, so that people understand what what the potential is. Yes, because it, yeah, it's it's something to build again and again. And I want to ask you the next thing, like for your career, you achieve so much great stuff, like to be on cruise ship, to work in many many countries. I want to know uh, maybe you have another big goals or something you fix for the future that you want to share with us. Uh, my goal is always to find very challenging and creative work. And, and that's really all it is to it. I just want to be continuing to do that. And I hope puppetry continues to do that in general. I want that for all puppeteers. I want them to be respected for their art and I want the, the jobs to be forthcoming for puppeteers to, to do this because it is a unique art form that, that I would hate to see lost. Uh, there's, you know, everything right now is, is kind of, uh, 
camera digitization of, yes. of everything, you know, CGI. And CGI has its place, but puppetry can even contribute to that. You mm -hmm. can start out with a practical puppet in a project and then just enhance it with CGI and you'll have something that's twice as good as it would be otherwise. CGI by itself can sometimes look artificial because the CGI people tend to make things too perfect. And we are all flawed in the way we move and the way we do things. There are all sorts of little quirks that happen and it's hard to pin down those quirks. But see, those things can happen through puppetry because it's, it's a human connected to it immediately. So right when you're doing it, that's you're, so you're true. putting in your own little oh, quirk. That's such a precise thing, but it's so visible. <laughs> yes. So the perfection. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we strive for perfection, but none of us will ever reach that type of perfection. And it looks artificial if it's actually yeah. there. True. It, it's like too good, too perfect, and, and uh, what what really makes characters interesting is their flaws, the little mm -hmm. things, the little peculiarities they do. That's yeah. what makes people interesting and the same with puppets. Yeah, to be unique, to be like, have something special, that's true. And I want also to ask you where, like, as you said, where do you see puppetry in 10 years from now? Um, I hope it will continue more in live theater as well as film. Yeah. And uh, yeah, wherever, you know, a lot of my work has been just entertaining as well. It's, I, I mean, even the entertaining, I try to, to enter into the dramatic qualities. I, I have variety characters that I use. And, and the reason I've gone to variety characters is because they have no language barrier. Yeah. And frequently, no cultural barrier. Everybody can enjoy an acrobat in the circus. And everybody can enjoy a trained dog on stage doing little things. Everybody can enjoy a, a, a singer or a, a, a instrumentalist or things like that. And even if it's being mimed, they can enjoy what you do. But I always call my, my creations vignettes because I try to have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and little arcs that happen in the personality and how the personality is revealed. And again, it's so important that every puppet has a unique personality. So it just doesn't come out and do gimmicks. It actually has something that, that is unique about it and people see that and they go, oh, wow, what, what's this? And how is he gonna do the next thing, you know? and, and that's what pulls them in. But uh, I, I hope that uh, puppetry will, will stay in all of those venues, in the entertainment business, in the dramatic business, and, and uh, continue in that way. I, like I said, because it's so flexible, I don't think we've even scratched the surface of what the potential is for puppetry. Yeah, we have so much to accomplish in the future. I really <laughs> agree on this. And also for the conclusion, I always like to put on those wonderful words, a puppet. So do you have a, a friend beside you you want to share with us on the screen? Yes, I have a little friend that I will bring in here and I'm gonna shift the camera down so that we'll be able to see her perform. <laughs> That's so interesting to to see your talent. I, I have to tell you that I was asking people who are the puppeteer of our time and Philip came up like an, a famous name. So I'm happy to present this work to everyone. Oh, <laughs> oh. Hola. I, 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 I miss my word when the, I see a puppet. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we want to pet him. Oh. Oh. <laughs> shake, shake. Shake. Oh, oh. <laughs> it, 
In French, we say fais le beau, fais le beau. <laughs> oh, so cool. Oh, oh my God, they move so well. <laughs> what is his name? What is your name, little dog? This is Effie. Oh, Effie. <laughs> yeah, you want to play? You want to play? <laughs> so you made this one, Philip, isn't it? Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. You build it from Yeah. And wow. It, it's wood and fur. Hello. She's wood cloth and fake fur. Yeah. And uh she has about 20 strings trying to keep her in camera here. <laughs> oh, you do. <laughs> That's good. It's nice that you carry a real one. It's, it's really. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the string, we can see. It. Wow. So 17 strings. 20 strings. Under. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Bravo. Beautiful. <laughs> That's so perfect. So Kathy has appeared all over the world. She she appeared at the Lido in Paris. And she was even a runway model for Bally Shoes in Switzerland at one point. She came out and she had stolen one of the shoes of the model and she carried it out later and delivered it to the model. So <laughs> That's but so she, she appeared in a Broadway show with Tommy Toon that was called Busker Alley. And uh, the, uh, at first they were concerned that it was a dog playing the part of a real dog in the show. But uh, she uh, actually got such great response from the audience. The questions that audience members would be talking about during the intermission would be, how does that dog do all of the movements in perfect time to the music? <laughs> And I was in full view. I was dressed as a busker in black, but it's still, they could see me there. Yeah. And they would become so entranced by her that uh, they would forget everything else. They would oh. believe it. <laughs> That's so perfect. We have plenty of comments right there. Like, bravo. We have Joe say, bravo. So honored to see. <laughs> yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So that's so cool. Thank you so much, little, little <laughs> dog. You're so cool. Yeah, it's a famous one. We could like uh, treat him, treat her with celebrity. She's a Broadway dog. Yeah, Taffy is probably one of my most famous characters. <laughs> and I call her my goodwill ambassador. She worked with me so many years on the, on the ship and she would appear at the captain's farewell cocktail party and go around to, to the tables and greet everyone and and people just fell in love with her she'd hop up in their laps and and lick them on the face and things like that <laughs> that's so magic it's perfect yeah so philip if people want to see more of your work more of your your stuff where they can find you how they can reach you uh they can search for me on, on facebook and uh, Philip Huber, H U B E R, and uh, they can also find me on um, on YouTube. I have my own channel on there, and I have several videos that they can see. Now, videos obviously are not my favorite way of showing what I do. When I create something that is on film or video, it, usually I want it created specifically for that medium, yeah. and and. So when they just do videos of my variety acts, they're not my favorite things because I always feel it deadens it a little bit. You don't appreciate those unless you can see them live. But I do have representations on there. I have a, a general video that just shows some of my career, uh, all the different things I've done in the career, little snippets from being John Malkovich and, and from Oz and some of the other things that I've done. And uh, but there are some of my variety acts on there and uh, possibly one of the most complicated variety acts I've ever created, which is a Chinese magician. He does six different illusions during his his act. 
and uh, he has 32 strings. And it took me two and a half years to develop that one act. Wow, I want to see that. So yeah, everyone have a look on the YouTube channel of Philip, for sure. We need to see this act. Thank you so much, Philip, for your time, your passion that you share with us tonight. It's a pleasure. Oh, thank you, Caroline. The pleasure was mine. Happy to be with you, happy to share what, what I know and have learned about puppetry. <laughs> Yay, thank you so much. So stay in the virtual studio. I will just push you uh, from the screen, you know, uh, we, we handle it and, and, and we chat after this, okay? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Yay, boom. Oh. <laughs> Yay, Philip is so amazing and talented. So everyone, thank you for watching. You know how it is sharing the puppetry passion. So yeah, feel free to to share it, share this interview, and also have a look to our Patreon where we do give some tools about promotion, how to promote puppetry, how to promote your work. So yeah, we, we have good tools for you, specifically for puppeteers, and we, we can have more, more stuff going on. So we have uh, also workshops. So feel free, I really invite you <laughs> to, to, to watch this. So yeah, so I want to say for the conclusion, stay well. And uh, yeah, I wish you a wonderful evening. And tomorrow we still have another episode. So it's a busy week for the Puppet Podcast. So I will say have a good evening. And yeah, see you tomorrow.